you're all part of the museum family, and I hope most of you know uh, Dr. Sarah Hume. We've been fortunate enough to have her here for 12 years, and I'm sure she has curated many of your favorite exhibitions. And I think most recently, the culture counterculture fashions of the 1960s and 70s that she curated for uh, the 50th commemoration of May 4th was really spectacular. This is a particularly um, interesting exhibition for Sarah. Um, she has her PhD in modern European history from the University of Chicago. So she's a really great uh, historian and an MA in costume and textiles from FIT and a BA in art from Yale. So she's covered all her bases. Um, but her particular area of scholarship is regional dress in Alsace and in, in France. So, um, and this exhibition is um, really a sister related to um, that scholarly interest in, in research by Sarah. Sarah, I'm turning things over to you now. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I hope everyone can see my, um, my screen, the slideshow. Can we, yes, yes, okay. I'm gonna assume that we can. Um, so yeah, so regional dress is my particular area of interest. And so for years, I've been hoping to do an exhibition here that focuses on European regional dress because the Kent State University Museum does have um, a fairly solid collection of, of odds and ends from all over Europe. Um, a lot of Eastern European, but also some examples of Western European regional dress, which we'll see. And as Sarah said, my, my area of expertise is Alsace and France. And um, of course, we have nothing from that area in the exhibition. So um, we will have to um, go a little bit further afield um, for these examples. Um, so the way I organized the exhibition um, I decided to not organize it geographically because there's a tendency with regional dress to think about it in terms of defining um, sort of national allegiance or even more local regional allegiance. Um, and even the term that I've chosen to use for regional dress mm -hmm. emphasizes this sort of geographic organization. Um, but for various logistical reasons, partly because I, it becomes divisive. Um, there is a way of sort of um, um, proclaiming your sort of local or national allegiance, which is um, sort of um, alienating from, from the, the group. And so I wanted to have a more collective look at regional dress um, and see of it as a sort of a phenomenon that is common across Europe rather than sort of dividing people, but it actually kind of brings together the, the rural populations of Europe. And so in order to organize it in a different way, I organized it by type of, of sort of the, wor the workmanship, the detail, the craft of it. And so this page shows the different categories that I have um, broken the pieces into. So um, brocade, um, there's examples of, of sort of embroidery with yarn, um, embroidery with metal, um, actually some of it's woven metal, some of it's embroidered, um, and then braid, um, lace and knit, these were actually two separate categories that became combined, um, um, and, and then stripes. Um, and so these sort of are things that you find in the regional dress from all sorts of different areas, um, and it sort of brings them together. So we'll start and we'll look at the brocade. Um, and one of the things, and there are sort of different kinds of regional dress that you see. Western Europe is a little bit different than when you get further Eastern Europe into um, more like Ukraine or, or a lot of sort of the Romanian, some of the Balkan. Um, you have a little bit more, there's, a, there's more handwork in some of the, um, the Eastern European. And the Western European, actually a lot of it depends on, on more manufactured goods, um, which is kind of kind of an interesting factor is that is that it seems like regional dress is a resistance against um, sort of the encroachment of of the homogenization of Western fashion 
And it's almost a form of resistance against that. Um, and these sort of local styles among sort of peasants or rural populations, um, as opposed to fashionable urban dress. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's dependent on goods that come from manufacturing. So the ribbons and stuff that are used, and you see this a lot all over Europe, it are the ribbons, the ribbons in the bonnets, the ribbons on the that are um, applicated onto the skirts. Um, and so this particular outfit is Hungarian, and it is a glorious example of all sorts of brocading. Um, so the skirt, which you can't see very well in the picture, but you can see in the image at the right is a detail of the skirt material, and it repeats this very large brocaded pattern um, that's in bold colors. Um, and then also on the apron, you can see these bands of ribbon. And these ribbons would be sort of very similar in, in regional dress that you find in Hungary, but also maybe in ribbons that you see in Austria or Germany or you know, other areas. So the ribbons aren't necessarily made locally um, or sort of distinctive to these different regional dresses. Um, but they are, I mean, they're, they're distinctive to regional dress in the way that they're used, but they're not necessarily specific to a region where they're made oopsies. Um, so you can see this. And one of the things that's so interesting about this, the, the bodice here actually is not brocaded, it's embroidered. It looks very similar to the skirt, but it is made in a completely different manner of execution. Um, but the thing that's interesting, and this one really showcases it, is one of the aspects of regional dress you'll see is this, just this super abundance of decoration. Um, and that's, you know, as Sarah was mentioning about the whole exhibition is that there is just so much going on in so many of these outfits and so many of these ensembles. And um, so some of these, like this particular outfit, I've chosen to show all the different pieces together. Um, but in organizing the exhibition, I tried to break some of the outfits apart and just show individual parts in order to sort of concentrate on different techniques. Because when you see the whole thing together, there's so much going on. There's just, it's so busy um, that you sort of lose some of the individual techniques because it just has this sort of overwhelming aspect to it. So you'll see some of these pieces are separated into different pieces and divided even into different sections because they apply to different sections. Um, um, but then this one had so much brocading that it sort of worked all together in the brocade section. Um, but here another example of brocading, which is a, a typical, as I said, are these sort of bonnets where you see these ribbons. And this, um, this is interesting. We actually have two bonnets in our collection, which are almost identical that look just like this. Um, this one is identified as being Danish and the other one oh, is wow. identified as German or Austrian or something. And so this is one of the mysteries to our collection. And one of the challenges to this exhibition is that um, the information we have about these pieces isn't always 100% reliable. Um, so, um, so I had to do some digging to figure out where a lot of these pieces were from. Sometimes you get information like Yugoslavian, which is super helpful these days. Um, so with this one, I did some research um, and I never found a bonnet that looked quite like this. It has this really interesting sunken part in, in the back of the crown. The, the crown is the, the um, bonnet has this sort of round, you know, sort of sunbonnet shape thing, but then the back of the bonnet sort of sinks into it where you see the, um, this back, which is very distinctive. And I couldn't find, um, there were quite similar ones that were Danish, that were sort of 19th century Danish um, folk dress. So I think it is Danish. But if anyone has expertise on this and knows it to be German, I am willing to be corrected on pretty much anything here. Um, but so, um, but this is this really beautiful ribbon, which is it was just hand brocaded, which is quite elaborate, um, and the ribbon is quite wide. It's like four or five inches wide. Um, and then here's sort of a detail of this, the ribbon, because not only does the ribbon have the, the you, it's a little hard to tell because it's black, but there is a sort of a damask quality to it. So there's a woven pattern in the black itself. And then there's the flowers that are woven into it. Mm. So it is really quite a stunning piece. And then the, the bonnet itself, the, the material on the bonnet is this patterned velvet. So it's sort of a cut and uncut patterned velvet with the ribbon on top of it. So 
it's quite lovely. And the the shape, the general shape wow. of the planet, it's difficult to know the date of a lot of these pieces, but it looks very much like 1840s kind of style. But sometimes the regional dress, it gets, um, it sort of, it, some sometimes it's described as being frozen in a in a time and it doesn't really stay exactly the same it does evolve shape but it it is very similar to sort of fashionable bonnets of the 1840s um, and then so moving on to our next section and this one actually i will say um the way the exhibit came together this one wound up being one of my favorite sections visually in the exhibition are the stripes um and this hey, just here's something for you to watch just this slide um, suggests to you how um, the sort of the boldness of some of the colors of these of these pieces. And so this again is one of those one of those pieces where I just isolated the skirt. We have I think we have one of these outfits from Portugal. We have most of the pieces, but I chose to break it up and just show the skirt by itself to really focus on the stripes. Because you see when you have the whole outfit together, the stripes aren't really what stands out. But um, there's this wonderful sort of um, embroidery, this sort of um, rough kind of um, embroidery with these big, bold patterns. Um, but, this, but the fabric itself is this hand-woven material. And so as I mentioned, some of the, um, some of the materials are more handmade and some of them are, are a little bit more manufactured. And so, so this is really an example of the handwork that goes into some of these pieces, this hand woven material. And then, um, I lost it. Oh, and with the hand weaving, stripes um, are really a very natural thing to do when you're when you're weaving. Um, you just change the colors of the weft material, or you alternate in the warp. You alternate colors, and so stripes are really wonderfully easy to arrive at. So it's sort of a natural function of the weaving process, and so you see this again and again. So it's a very common um, patterning. To, to have it, whereas the, the brocading tends to be these floral patterns and very elaborate. Um, uh, then in alternate to that, you have these um, stripe patterns, which are very geometric. And in these Portuguese ones, the thing that's really interesting about these Portuguese costumes are these, these sort of little tufts that they've created. And I honestly don't know whether they've woven this into it um, or whether they actually picked it with embroidery later on. I'm not entirely sure the technique because it could, something you could probably could achieve through weaving, um, but also could be done as an embroidered technique. And so it gives it this, this kind of um, texture to it. And that's one of the things that's so wonderful is that is the texture and the depth to it and why it's really worth coming and looking at the pieces in, in person and seeing um, the texture of them. And then another striped one, and this one is more of a manufactured cloth kind of, um, it's a flannel, it's really a flannel underskirt. Um, and so you see, um, and, we ha and this one again, we have a whole outfit, um, but I've just shown the skirt. And I actually, once we put it on exhibit, I my student assistant and I were looking at it and decide, once she realized that it had a pair of wooden clogs that went with it, she, um, I got very excited about the wooden clogs. And so I decided that um, they would add to it. So I don't have a picture of it with the wooden clogs, but on exhibit, there's a pair of wooden clogs that are completing this look. It's just a skirt and clogs. So, but um, it, gives it, it gives it this very Dutch flavor. And so you can see when it's assembled in this whole outfit, the, the stripes are not the star of the show in the whole outfit because there's a lot, there's a lot going on and the star of the show actually becomes the bonnet, which we'll see in a second. Um, but you can see this um, is, is the sort of quintessentially Dutch outfit and um, it, became it's it's um, Volendam is you know this sort of area of of the Netherlands um, but this particular costume has has become sort of associated with with the country as a whole um, and has become there's sort of derivative versions of it that um, have come to um, 
be used a lot in advertisement. And this um, bonnet is really particularly the feature that is probably best known. This is the wooden clogs. The wooden clogs say the Netherlands, um, but they're not in any way distinctive to a particular region or village or anything. Wooden clogs um, you see a lot all over all over Europe, certainly Western Europe, you see them in France and and, um, and the Netherlands and stuff. Um, it's just sort of a working class or a rural kind of um, footwear. Um, but but it is closely associated in the mind with, with the Netherlands because they've sort of promoted this image. And you see this a lot in cheese advertisement. I don't know whether anyone has, has seen this, but, um, but you, in going to Amsterdam, they would have these cheese shops and there would be these girls dressed in these costumes with the, with the bonnet, with the wings, um, selling cheese. But really, if you take a close look at this bonnet, it is really extraordinary. Um, we did a little, um, a little fluffing of it to get the shape of these wings because it was crushed because it was laying flat in the box for many, many years. Um, so we steamed it, we put some, um, a, rolled a towel up and filled out the, the wing in order to steam it because it was heavily starched. Um, so these little pleats that you can see in here are, are heavily starched and I think they, they take sticks I don't know exactly how they do it in, in this region, but there's different areas around Europe have various um, various headgear that involves, or, or neck, sometimes it's ruffs, and they take little sticks and they wind them in and out of the um, lace, and then they, they hit it with starch and they sort of let it dry and it creates these patterns. And also what you can see, if you look really closely, I don't know whether you can see it from your home computers, um, is that there's actually a thread running through here that's stitching this together and holding it. So it's almost like a gathering thread that's then pulled this very um, careful up and down shape of this bonnet. And so it creates, it creates the, um, makes it pull around the face and then it curves, it, it pulls it into the, um, I, my pointing at the screen is not gonna help you. Um, it pulls it into the shape of the wing. Um, and then the back of it is this beautiful, this beautiful rich lace. Um, and so this really is the classic um, shape uh, the, the classic sign. And so these lace caps, the caps tend to be one of the hallmarks of regional dress from different areas and is one of the most identifying features of them. Um, and some regions have very distinctive dress and Follendam is one of these areas. Um, Brittany in France has a number of different very distinctive head hats um, and um, Normandy also has distinctive um, bonnets You'll see there's a Spanish hat in the, in the exhibit, which I don't have a picture of in the slideshow, but it is something else. Um, it is this crazy bonnet um, covered with pom-poms and mirrors. I, I'm sorry, I left this out. I'm just tempting you with this knowledge because you'll have to come to see the exhibition in order to see the bonnet um, from Spain. Um, so here, so this is also lace. So you see lace in the in the headdresses. You see it, um, this sort of white work. And this is kind of interesting because instead of making it white work in this blouse, they have done black stitches. So a lot of times you'll see very similar work, but it's all white. Um, but this one they've done it in black, so you see the contrast. You see the cut work. So this pleated sleeve cuff is is sort of cut out in this floral arrangement and then stitched with kind of a probably like a buttonhole stitch or some sort of um, satin stitch around the the opening in the that makes this lace so they've created this kind of rustic lace um, and then here again they have done like cut and drawn work and and filled it in so it becomes lace through this sort of embroidery technique so it's kind of a, a coarser example of lace it's not the, the fineness of something like that cap we just saw 
And then there's another row of just black lace that is stitched onto the edge of the hem. And this is probably like tatting work that's done by hand. Um, and one of the things that's actually interesting, you can see in the picture, um, the sleeve, the right sleeve, the lace is actually turned brown. Um, so it, it's different. It doesn't quite match the lace on the rest of the sleeves. Um, it, that was one of the things putting together, dressing these dresses and putting things together is that um, they are, a lot of them are very, um, the word I've tended to use is wonky. A lot of them are very symmetrical. They don't quite fit. They've been taken in in strange ways. They are, um, they're very strange. There's, there's really strange features once you start looking closely at them. The, the, you know, the way the two sleeves are made is not quite the same or they are very crooked. So it's part of the magic of the whole thing. Um, so as the curator and, and sort of putting the pieces on the mounts, um, in some ways you're trying to disguise these features. Like these two sleeves, um, like they sat very differently. One wanted to stick up and one sort of um, slouched down. So there's, there's sort of a lot of play with these um, in order to, in some ways I wanna overcome this sort of um, quality of it and yet, um, it is an important aspect to these sort of folk dresses and regional dress um, that it is very handmade and um, you know made made by the loving hands of home as Jean always called it. Um, and so here we are moving to another um, section and also another um, area of Europe. So this is Scandinavian. This is actually um, from Norway, and um, and the Norwegian. And it's similar in in in, um, in Sweden and in Denmark, maybe a little bit. Um, but you have this sort of revival in the turn of the century, around 1900. You have some people who became really interested in these styles that were disappearing. Actually, this is the sort of the common theme all over Western Europe: um, is you have you have people who take an interest in these rural styles and they go around and they sort of collect examples and they document them and they photograph people wearing their traditional dress um, in, in efforts to sort of save it. And they, they, um, they have organized efforts to, to continue to award people for continuing to wear them. Young girls who wear them for certain festivals and stuff get awards and um, prizes and, and stuff like that. And so there's efforts to save them so they don't disappear. And then actually what happens in Norway, there's a woman and I, have, I can't remember her name, but she actually sort of goes in this sort of reconstruction. And so she goes and she sort of invents these styles for different villages and creates ones for each of these different villages. And in Norwegian, the name for these dresses, these traditional dresses, is a bunad. And, um, and so they, they sort of have these bunads. And this image, um, which is actually from a shop which now sells them, you can go in, in Norway and you can buy all these elements of traditional dress. And, um, and they sort of have this sort of commercial commercial presence. And they are distinctive for different villages and different regions have their own one. And this is the one, I think it's for the area right around Lillehammer. And it was, it was, there's a person, I don't remember his name, but there was a man who sort of designed this style in the, I think it was from the 1930s. So there's this sort of history to the styles and there's these moments of sort of resurrection and reconstruction. And so this one from, um, in, in Norway, there was sort of a big campaign and you see it a lot. There's, there's like a certain holiday in, in, in Norway when everyone wears their bunads, all their, they dress in their traditional dress. Um, and you can see their dress includes um, this purse and it has this sort of metal clasp and it has a, a hook that hooks onto the dress of the waistband. Um, and, um, and then there's sort of a matching bonnet. Um, and one thing that you'll see in, in these pictures is they have, they have a brooch. And I will admit um, this brooch is not, this is not a real brooch that we have added to it. It felt like the blouse needed something. The blouse doesn't have a fastener, I think. And so we needed to have something that closes the blouse and it needs, it needs a brooch because that's part of the costume. So we went through the installation jewelry and found some like really garish earrings or brooches or something and 
put them on there. So don't think that's part of it when you see that. That is part of the, the, the illusion of the museum um, at completing the look. Um, but it was sort of necessary and it is part of, it's one of the things that you can buy on these sites that sell bunads um, is you can buy the, the associated jewelry. Um, and so also in the yarn, I didn't even talk about the embroidery on that other one. It has this beautiful yarn embroidery. Um, another a very different style of embroidery you see in these Portuguese, um, these Portuguese costumes. And as I said, we have this, this skirt, this apron is actually part of a complete outfit. Um, it's, it's not the same as the piece that I showed you before, oh. the red striped skirt, although I think it's from the same, I mean, it's, oh. it's both Portuguese, oh, yeah. but, oh. um, but oh, yeah. is just the, um, just the apron, because the apron has this distinctive technique, and it's almost like a rug. It's like a hooked rug kind of style of embroidery that you can see it has this very distinct um, texture to it. And then it has, this is the edge of it, which has this sort of ribbon around the edge. And it is a very bold shade of pink, which you can see um, in the picture at the right, which is sort of a folk group that's wearing these costumes now. You can see this sort of bright pink and green coloration of the of the apron and it's worn with these red skirts and um, the the sort of idea of matching and coordinating color is very distinct in these um, uh, that you see across regional regional dress um, is that their ideas of sort of matching are not the way that we match and the way fashionable dress in in sort of urban fashionable dress like coming out of Paris and stuff had had very coordinated color palettes and stuff like that whereas in contrast, you see this this sort of the colors and the patterns that are assembled in these in this regional dress. Um, it operates under a sort of a very different principle. You know, you have a different style of of embroidery on the sleeves and on the on the bodice that goes on top, and then the head scarf is a totally different aesthetic altogether. Um, so you can see the sort of the sort of complexity and elaborateness of of the of the patterning. Um, and then one thing that, and, and another thing about the stress, so, so this section of metalwork really highlights this, is that um, when you think about, think about the regional dress, it's associated with sort of peasants, um, which, is, which is a term I, I tend not to use. Um, it's a strangely pejorative term and um, somewhat dismissive of, of a really elaborate rural culture across Europe. Um, and also, it, it, you, think of, you think of peasants as being humble and, and of modest means, to put it mildly. And, and a lot of the regional dress you see is very elaborate and very expensive. And, and today it's certainly expensive, you know, these boonads or something. I mean, you're gonna pay like a thousand dollars for these for these outfits. Um, but historically they took a great deal of, of means and resources. And um, the, the sort of the clearest example of that are these ones that are made out of metal and gold in particular. So you see these, these, um, these areas, sort of the Balkans, the sort of Southern Eastern Europe that are, um, that were under the, under the Ottoman empire um, or have a lot of Ottoman influence. So Greek, Bulgaria, um, Albania. So that sort of area, you'll see a lot of very Turkish, the very Ottoman elements to it. And this metalwork is one of the things that's characteristic and you see it a lot in what, what we have is is cataloged as Albanian, although it could be it, you see similar things in a lot of these different countries in that area. Um, but it's this gold braid that is applied on on a ground of it's some of it. I think it's a red. It's a really deep red velvet. Um, you can't really see the the ground cloth because it's so completely covered with this embroidery. So you see this braid that's embroidered on it, and then you have these strips of ribbons that are also applied in these patterns. And it's very heavy and it's it's actually, it's big in one sense in that it's like incredibly cumbersome sort of garment, but it's made for an extremely small body. So it's this strange combination of being tiny and being very large at the same time. 
Um, and so we have, we have this piece, it's Albanian, we have another, a smaller vest um, that's also from the same area. Um, and, but we also, the metal work, there's a lot of sort of metal work that goes into these, this headgear that you see more in sort of Central Europe, um, particularly Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic. Um, you see it some, you see it some in Eastern France too. And Alsace actually has examples of a sort of silver lace on bonnets. Um, but this is sort of the most um, elaborate example is this, what's called in German, uh, a Riegelhaube. And it's this, this encrusted metallic um, bonnet. And it, it is sort of like a bun cover. Um, and it was worn, it was started to be worn um, around the 1840s or so. And it was, it was worn in Munich largely and was part of fashionable dress. So it would be worn with urban fashionable dress. It wasn't worn with something that was distinctive or, re or necessarily, I mean, it was regional in that it was Bavarian, but it wasn't, um, it, the, the dress itself wasn't distinctive from fashionable dress. Um, so it would just, this was a, a sort of a local particularity, a form of headwear, um, but it was worn by people in the city too. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily rural, which sort of complicates the understanding of what exactly regional dress is. Um, but you see these and they persist. And this picture is a photograph of someone in a folk group now who has her own example of a regal haube. Um, and we have, we have a strangely large number of regal haube in our collection. Um, we have at least eight that, and they're very, very similar. We have two in the exhibition, which um, are again, very, very similar. I have to be careful every time I look at them to make sure I'm, I get the numbers right because they are interchangeable, very similar. And they have these boxes that are shaped kind of like a loaf of bread. Like you can see that they're sort of a cross section of a loaf of bread. Um, and they have these boxes that are fitted to them. And so we have a couple of, of them that come in their own special Regal Helva boxes. I'm sure in German, there's a word for Regal Helva box. In them. Um, and then here also continuing in our um, sort of central European phase, um, this is our Swiss um, regional dress. And this is from Bern. And um, I, I came to understand that Bern is, is the canton in Switzerland. It's not just the city of Bern, it's the whole sort of area around that. And in particular, this costume seems to come from Emmental. And I will say when I was doing my research for this, um, I, um, I made the mistake of, of Googling Emmental bonnet in order to find pictures of this, like this picture. So that was a kind of Google search I would do to find this. But Emmental bonnet gives you these strange um, bonnets shaped like cheese. That, so it was like the uh, cheese heads. Um, wearing these big triangles and cheese on their head. So that was kind of a strange direction that my research took me in. Um, but so this, um, so this bonnet, again, this whole costume comes from about 1900, which was kind of the, the sort of apotheosis of, of regional dress. Um, and when they become their most elaborate and are continuing to be worn in these villages. Um, and this, this um, bodice is heavily boned um, and then it has these silver, these silver flowers on them that lace together with a silver cord. Um, and then you can see the the work on this is these these sil these steel beads um, that are that are embroidered onto the black velvet. So it is absolutely a stunning piece. Um, so it has this little cute bonnet. Um, surrounded by this crinoline lace. So it's like this net made of like horse, I think it actually is horse hair. It's very stiff um, and it holds this shape. And then you see these, these um, steel um, embroidered on in flowers embroidered all over this. And it's actually a little bit more, the one we have is a little bit more elaborate than the one in the picture, which doesn't have the embroidery on it. It has the steel, I mean, it has these silver, these silver hooks that hold that you lace it with, um, and and then it also this is my favorite aspect of this outfit is that it has um, what we came to term arm, armpit jewelry. Um, there are these 
it's a it's a little hard to see exactly what's going on. You can see it in the in the postcard a little bit better. Is it has these silver flowers on the front, and they attach to this chain, which runs under the arm and then links up in the back. And then here you can see the back of the collar. Um, it has this hook that they hook onto the back. So there are these chains that wrap under the arms and hook to the back. It is a very particular style of jewelry. And actually, it was interesting, the outfit that we found, we have two outfits from Bern, Switzerland. Um, and one of them was less elaborate. One of them has this beautiful embroidery and that's the one I wanted to use, but it was missing its armpit jewelry. So I assembled the armpit jewelry from the second, um, the second outfit and put, and it also had the black mitts, which were also absent from the first outfit. So this is actually assemblage of two outfits from the same area um, to make the complete outfit um, because it, it really finished it off to have, um, well, it needed the armpit jewelry. We were very disappointed when we realized it wasn't gonna have armpit jewelry, but rest assured it does. Um, and so here is the, um, the next section. Um, and this is braid. And this is actually um, an element in a lot of the regional dress, which um, is concentrated more in men's wear than in women's wear. Um, we actually have it in both, but a lot of these examples are men's wear. And that was one of the things that I wanted to definitely focus on in the exhibition was to include men's wear as well. Um, so much of our, our collection, so much of our exhibitions focuses on women's wear. And women's wear in a lot of these regional dress examples is a very elaborate, but men also have these equivalent costumes, and I wanted to make sure to concentrate on that. In a lot of Europe, um, men sort of abandoned distinctive dress earlier than the women did, um, and the, the women's costumes tends to be used more for for sort of as it becomes politicized, as it becomes propaganda, as it becomes advertisement, as it you know, functions in all these different ways that regional dress comes to function. It tends to be women that are the focus of this. You'll see ads with, you know, like the Dutch girl selling cheese and stuff. It's a Dutch girl, like you see the, the male dress a lot less. Um, but I wanted to make sure to include menswear because it is, it is highly elaborately embroidered and, and decorated just like the women's wear. And so here um, is an example of a Romanian outfit. Um, and you can see, and this is, it looks like a lapel. It looks like the collar of the coat, but it's actually stitched down to the jacket. So it's just this embroidered, it's this sort of appliqued piece of, um, of sort of a burgundy satin or taffeta that's then has the braid applied over it. And it's a jacket worn over a vest. So here, this image on the right, you see this the shirt underneath. So there's a shirt and then a vest and then a jacket. So it is, it is four pieces um, total put together in this outfit. Um, and the Kansas State University Museum has a very extensive um, collection of Romanian costumes. And I don't know um, if any of you have been, um, have been supporters of the museum since the beginning, but back in the 90s, there was an exhibition that was entirely Romanian dress. Um, it was the whole museum, everything was Romanian. And we still continue to have a very strong collection of Romanian pieces. Um, and there are a lot of Romanian pieces in the exhibition. Um, I focused the, the, the talk on all the different sort of aspects. Um, I didn't want it to seem like it's all Romanian, but we could do, I mean, we could obviously do a show just of Romanian as has been done. But here's another example of braid. And this one, it's actually interesting. In the cataloging, it said that this was a man's vest. Um, but um, Jim was making the mount for it. And he's just like, this fits really funny. I don't, this doesn't work. And so I did a little further research into it and realized it didn't work because it was not intended to be, to be worn on a man's body. It definitely needed to be on a woman's body. Because um, you can see the way these sort of tabs go and then they're fixed at the waist underneath the belt. So there's a belt that's worn over it that holds it together. Um, so Jim made these brilliant mounts for it out of clear plastic. And so as you see them, the mounts are, they disappear. So you don't really see um, the mounts in it, but, um, but that 
posed some problems with some of the ones that didn't have fasteners and didn't close properly. So um, this is actually pinned in here just to hold it together because in reality, when it's in the whole outfit all together, um, it's worn under a belt. Um, and so this is the back of it. Um, it has the square of, or rectangle of velvet at the very back that's surrounded by this incredibly elaborate braid embroidery. And it's this kind of tiny garment in this very elaborate outfit. All right, so that is the end of the, the first, that's not the end, it's the end of the first section of the exhibition. Um, so the exhibit is in the Steger and Blum galleries, and so there's two different galleries, and one is organized, as I've just gone through, um, by the sort of, by the type of work. And then the second gallery, the Blum, the little gallery at the end, looks at um, sort of traditional blouses and peasant blouses and their sort of evolution and, and variation. And so this back wall fo focuses on sort of the rich variety of, um, of traditional blouses, the different shapes, the different proportions. Um, you can see some, some um, blouses are really actually more of a dress. That's the underlayer. Um, these front three are Romanian women's dresses, um, and some are shorter. This one on the corner is a man's shirt. Um, this outfit um, is also a man. It's actually kind of a boy. It's a very small outfit. We had trouble finding a mannequin for it because it's very small. Um, so, but they have this wide variety of very elaborate embroidery. You can see the, the variations in it from this. Um, this one in the back, actually I should have shown a picture of this one because um, the embroidery on it is actually beads. It's hard to see when you look at it, it looks like it's just embroidered with these flowers, but they're these tiny seed beads that cover the whole thing. Um, so that's a very distinctive style um, of embroidery. It's very different from these others. Um, these are Macedonian and Greek, and then, then Romanian and Slovakian. Um, so you see the sort of the range across Eastern Europe of the different dress styles. Um, and here's a couple of the details of it. And as Sarah said, again, like just the workmanship and the details of these is really extraordinary. And as you look closer, you just see, um, and for instance, this um, chemise from, from Romania, um, the, the finish on the bottom has this edge of is a sort of stitched edge. And then the seams, and this is true in a lot of these Romanian blouses, is the seams are open and they're stitched together with this sort of embroidery that holds it together. And so a lot of the seams on it have this sort of open work. Um, and then this embroidery, what looks kind of dark brown is actually made with gold. Some of it I think is made with a gold thread. So it's really, um, really a lab, you know, it's, it's beautiful when you look at it and then you look closer and you see these levels of um, workmanships on them. And then this, again, is this tiny sort of boy, it's not tiny, but it's a boy's outfit. Um, and it's, it's very elaborately embroidered in this, this sort of cross stitch like style of embroidery. And then it has what I'm guessing is a name that's embroidered on it. And then the edge, the hem of the entire shirt is finished with these sequins, which just dangle from the bottom of it, um, which is really stunning um, and would be beautiful if he were moving and not a mannequin, because um, you'd see the motion and the flittering of these sequins. Um, and then the final section, it's actually like the middle section of the Blum Gallery. Um, it sort of reflects on the way that uh, regional dress and particularly these sort of peasant blouses have inspired fashionable looks. And it was a really big fashion in the 1920s. Um, and part of the reason was that when you, in the late teens into the 20s, you see, you see a lot of people from Russia who left, um, who left Russia at that point, the Soviet Union, when you, after you have the Russian revolution, you see sort of a, you see people sort of, um, Ex exiting, emigrating from Russia. So you have you have waves of immigrants um, from Eastern Europe, particularly Russia, into fashionable centers like um, Paris, and they enter the fashion industry. And so you see this influence of peasant dress and peasant costumes in um, in 
in fashion. And so this example is an ad, it's a French ad for this house it doesn't actually match this dress, it matches another dress we had, but it, the condition of that dress um, wasn't so good. But it, it looks like this and you see these women who'd come from Eastern Europe who are working in, in the fashion industry and are creating these, these sort of styles inspired by their traditional cultures. Um, and here you see this sort of smocking and workmanship. And it's, you know, it's not the sort of heavy, um, heavy techniques that you see in some of the true Eastern European regional dress, but you see the sort of the inspiration from the sort of um, the dolman sleeves and the, the smocking and the, and the workmanship of that um, and the handwork. And it has this beautiful, just the where it's um, hemmed, you see this sort of stitching. It's worth, you know, taking a closer look. It looks kind of simple at first, and then you look at and you realize the workmanship that's gone into it. And this has continued, the, the influence of peasant costume um, was really big in the 70s. Um, and Yves Saint Laurent was one designer who in particular looked at, at Eastern European um, fashions and peasant dress for his collection. And you can see this in his Russian collection, and, which I think was 1976. Um, and so here are a couple of um, examples of, of the shots and the sketches from that collection. And then here is an, the example that we have um, that was drawn from that collection. So, and there's another piece that's by Oscar de Laurenta, which is very clearly has the sort of the ribbons and the embroidery and the peasant blouse and the, the work. And you can really see the inspiration that they took um, and how it inspires, you know, fashion today. So that does bring us to the end of my talk. And I would be happy to, um, to take questions if people have them, um, I can move to that. Anyone has questions? So Sarah, maybe I'll start with just yes. um, a you know sort of general question of so is it wrong if we call this? I mean, we call it regional dress, but you know, do we need to worry about calling it folk dress or what are the distinctions or what is the you know, and sort of why is it important for you to call it regional dress? Yes. So this is one thing that I've struggled with a lot. And I have gone through, I've actually gone through various iterations. And my dissertation calls it traditional dress. And I had this long discourse over tradition, because tradition is kind of a, kind of um, a weighted term in, in historiography. Um, because the problem with this idea of tradition is that um, there's this idea that it's fixed and frozen, and that it's, you know, people looking back to some like past um, example that is sort of true example and, and it doesn't change. And one thing that's really important to understand about regional dress is that it does change and has a history and it has an evolution and, it, and, um, and so like you can date the pieces, um, they don't stay the same over time. And so I wanted to get away from that idea of fixedness it, that's implied by using the term traditional. And so I made an argument in my dissertation about using traditional um, and what it means. But then I've read other documentation and the comments that I've gotten from, <laughs> from submissions for articles and stuff where they were sort of critical of the term. And then, then more recent um, scholars on it use the word, have debated the word regional dress, um, which has its own problems. But I've, I've latched on to, um, in order to get away from the idea of traditional. Um, folk dress, I use to refer to this kind of clothes that are worn by folk groups and is a more recent sort of reference, but it's not part of people's everyday lived experience. Like if you get up and you wear, it's just, you have a certain dress that you wear to church on Sundays um, and that's your region, like that's your regional dress. I would have originally called that traditional dress and would have separated that from something that's folk dress, which is worn by these groups when they sort of reenact this and they dress out their, their culture. And so I refer to that sort of phenomenon as being a more modern iteration of it. And that's folk dress, which I would group still under this bigger heading of regional dress, which I use as the whole heading. One of the books that I read in this whole debate of what is the proper term for this, um, they went for ethnic dress, which I actually find more problematic. Um, I think that ethnic is, is a troublesome, that strikes me wrong. And it also implies that sort of 
Western culture is not ethnic and then it's sort of everybody else and it, it's, it was a problematic, it, I don't like, didn't, I didn't go for ethnic dress. Um, so that is sort of my thinking on the issue. Um, and um, yeah, it's broad. Thank you. Nancy, you're muted. I can unmute you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Now, what what uh, interested me uh, from the beginning is all the different ways that Sarah mentioned. She mentioned embroidery. She mentioned tatting, tatting, uh, hooking. Um, there's so many different forms of how these garments are made, and <clears throat> with needles or with whatever you, you know. So, can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different techniques and um, and it's one of the things that you see, I think you see more as you go sort of into Eastern Europe has more of the handwork to it and the Western Europe, although the example, the Swiss one did have a lot of embroidery. You'd see like the postcard of the Swiss outfit doesn't really have embroidery. It just has sort of like manufactured items that are sort of stitched onto it and you see sort of the ribbons that are used. So there's less of the handwork and less of the fine embroidery and it's less about showcasing the skills and um, a lot of the discussion that people that some scholars go into when they're studying regional dress is the symbolism of the different patterns and you see that a lot as you're getting into like Romanian or um, you know Slovakian or the the Eastern European dress the difference the different embroidery patterns have different meaning and their symbols of fertility and, and this and that. And um, to be honest, I am generally less interested in, um, in tracing that, that kind of meaning. Um, and I'm always a little skeptical of thinking that these, that there is sort of these cultural, I mean, there are certainly cultures where they have these meanings and they do convey that, but, I, but, um, but I, I'm not sure how aware people are of these these sort of encoded meanings in it. Um, and it's sort of like um, like Scottish, Scottish regional dress of which we have none, unfortunately. You know, the different, the different patterns are different families and, and all of that. And that turns out that that was kind of invented in the 18th century. They just sort of made this up. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't, doesn't have this long legacy where you have these clans and they have their own, tar they have their own tartans. It was sort of, there's sort of some guy in the, in the like late 1700s made up a book and he like had all these, had all these things and that's where it came from. So um, that's actually, um, it gets to the, the origin of the like the problems with the word tradition because um, that's that story is in the, this book about the invention of tradition and that that is sort of this this way of, of talking about regional dresses that aha it's it's fake it's it only comes about in the 19th century it's not this like ancient legacy of these peoples of that have their own distinct styles um, so a lot of these Western European styles are an invention of the invention of the of the 19th century. But that's that's a little getting away from what your question was about the techniques. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that's so amazing about these is the lace and the the um, the the embroidery techniques um, that are just, you know, are, are just, it's, you know, you just go and you see them and you just realize, you know, how these things were hand done and they were, you know, made so complicated. By oh. Yeah. And because a lot of, you know, fashionable dress, you have people who are professional and they make, they make lace or they do embroidery, but these, you know, a lot of these would be done by people and it would be, they do their own, they do their own outfits, they do their wedding dress or something. So it's a different sort of approach to the handwork than, than a lot of the professional and workshops and stuff that you see in, in fashionable dress. I mean, Sarah and I, I would go in and look and, and, you know, we'd be examining, a, can you hear me? We'd be examining a piece and it's like, okay, so is that, that lace is tatted Mm -hmm. And then there's a kind of satin stitch embroidery with one kind of material, but then there's another material over here using it. I mean, it's that kind of um, incredible, beautiful layering on mm -hmm. of, you know, obviously by people who probably had a wide range of needle skills. Mm -hmm. so. Well, they were beautiful. It's really, it was a beautiful program. Thank you. 
yeah, the exhibit is really, I mean, it's a, it's a visual sort of, it's an arresting, there's, you know, it's a lot, it's a busy, you know, some of, a lot of times with my exhibitions, I tend to have sort of a more pared down, um, more minimal, minimalist, not quite, but I mean, uh, and, um, and, and this one is, a, is, 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 it has a busy, sort of a more busy um, overall impression of it, because, and that's part of, you know, part of the beauty of this regional dress is just how many, how, complicated and how much they assemble these different styles and designs and, and have a different aesthetic for combining patterns than um, you see in, in, in like urban dress. I think I, I know in Norway that they hand these down in, in families. Mm -hmm. And I, am, I suppose they do in other areas. Sure. Um, in Norway, they're pretty strict about uh, how they should look. They really prefer it if you have them professionally made. Mm. And if you do it yourself, you have to take it in so they can look it over and approve it. Mm -hmm. um, but I see in pictures, I see in photos, a lot of small children wearing things that obviously their moms put together. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they're not as fancy. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, you know, I have a question, which is, do you have any idea how they clean these things? I mean, it seems to me that you wouldn't have been able to wash any of them. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And there are some pieces that I was tempted to steam because they're kind of wrinkled, but I was afraid because I was really not sure about um, the color safeness. The color, yeah. Of the color fastness of the, um, the different embroidery. I was really afraid things were, I was- Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think you could spot clean things, but, um, you know, part of it is that you have, you have layers. And so the outer layer, I mean, you could spill, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't get your um, outfit on. I, I mean, the under, the undershirts kind of, it, the pieces that have undershirts that are plain white, those are definitely very sturdy. One of the things that's really interesting about the pieces um, is that a lot of them are very sturdy. You know, we work really? with these, um, you know, the 19th century um, European, uh, the like silks and they're very fine and fragile and stuff. And some of these, you know, we were using, we were touching and we realized we'd handle them kind of roughly because they're, they're, they're like industrial strength out there. Right, right. They're hardy. Um, so they don't have kind of the delicacy of um, a lot of fashionable dress. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, some of these kind of like hand, homespun, hand-woven um, shirts and stuff, quite, they're yeah. durable in some ways, and then some, you know, are shedding sequins. Some of these ones that I showed the sequins, there's piles of sequins on the floor. So, I mean, the, you know, there are condition issues and stuff with them, but, you know, a lot of them are wool and, and um, pretty hardy or cotton. Right. Well, probably linen. They didn't really have cotton yeah. in there early on in Europe. Yeah, that's true. And you know, they were still, I, I went up to the Hungarian museum once and they had some items of clothing there. And the woman who was uh, there talking about it said that she remembered before she left Hungary, uh, she had an aunt who had a field of flax. Mm that they then harvested and processed into linen. So that was certainly within, yeah. you know, in the 1900s. Yeah. Still were doing that. Yeah, I have pictures of, of people in, um, in Alsace in, the, I think the pictures are from like the 1920s or so. And they're, they're doing their um, laundry in the rivers. They're like, you know, they have these, these laundries that are that are outside and the groups of people are out there washing in the in the rivers. And so, you know, rural um, Europe was um, it, it, well into the 20th century. But you know, I know in Norway, uh, even again in the early 1900s, they did not wash clothes in the winter time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they just wore things yeah. all winter and then wash things all at once in the spring. 
You have to figure it wouldn't definitely freeze. That would be a problem if you're doing your laundry in the river. And right, exactly. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's that's real. Right. Yeah. Huh. Well, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. great, Jenny. Um, are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Just thank you, Sarah. It was just marvelous, really. A lot yeah, of us showed all of your hard work. <laughs> so I Great. hope you are all super excited to come see the show. Yes. <laughs> um, we open Tuesday at 11 a.m. Go online. If you're feeling comfortable about visiting, we are masked. We're actually usually double masked. Um, same protocols. Reserve your time. We hope to see you. I also wanted to, before we leave, um, first of all, thank you for joining us today. And um, also we've got, just as of last night, we've added another um, event as part of Black History Month on February 25th at 5.30. And you'll be getting information about this, but we are going to have a little preview uh, discussion of the fall exhibition, Textures, the History and Art of Black Hair. This is the oh. major exhibition that we produced the beautiful catalog on and our two curators will be speaking and we hope to have one of the writers for the catalog. Um, so you will be hearing more about that, but I wanted you to be among the first to know that um, we'll, be, we'll be presenting that and we're very happy to start getting the word out about textures, which is coming in September.